Alison. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. Now, I'm afraid I'm not an academic and I'm not a performer. In fact, uh, I've only ever been on stage twice before in my whole life. I was at school and we did a production of Macbeth and I was one of the three witches. I forgot my lines, I walked off stage and that was the end of my acting career. So I'm afraid I've got my script on a clipboard here, which James tells me clipboards are really difficult to come by now. And this one's made out of recycled juice cartons. Um, the other time that I was on stage was when I was in Paris and I went to a very well-known hairdressing salon to get my hair cut. And after they'd washed my hair, they took me down a corridor, through a door, and then I realised I was in the wings of a stage. And the next thing they said to me, in French, of course, was, don't forget to smile. And they literally, like this, pushed me on stage, and there was a chair there, and I sat there and had my hair cut in front of hundreds of people. And to make matters worse, of course, it was all done in French. I didn't know what they were doing to my hair. There was no mirror for me to look at. All I had was the audience to look at, and they were looking at me. And then to add insult to injury, I had to walk down into the auditorium while everyone took photographs of me with my hair cut. So <laughs> when I eventually went back to the, the salon behind the stage, I, in my best French, I said, and uh, how much is that? And they said the magic words, nothing, it's free. And I thought, oh, that was great, wasn't it? So I've always been quite keen on getting stuff for free. When I was a kid, I used to enter lots of competitions, and I'd win loads of prizes. And I've still got my giant box of Lego and my box of um, Matchbox motorway cars at home. And I used to walk a lot. When I was a teenager, I'd walk in order to save buying a bus ticket. And now, as a grown-up, I cycle everywhere for the same reasons. I don't have to pay money on public transport. Um, I've also, as you can see from my T-shirt here, I am a, an usher here at the Nuffield Theatre. Now, rather ironically, um, I actually had offered to usher here today before I got asked to speak, which was a bit weird, because the organisers had no idea that I volunteered here. But one of the reasons why I do volunteer is because, obviously, I love helping my local arts centre, but I also like seeing free shows. So... <laughs> So it's one of the fringe benefits. Um, if anybody else would like to usher here, go and sign up. They've got 100 people here that volunteer, and to be honest, the theatre couldn't survive without them. Um, I have done other things for free before in the past. When I was in Australia, I had a job at a youth hostel where, because I didn't have the work permit, I offered to work just in exchange for accommodation. And they said they would give me a letter at the end of my six months contract, which would then give me an offer of employment, so that if I ever wanted to emigrate, like you do, it would help me. And that is exactly what happened. I used that letter, I did get to emigrate to Australia. It would never have happened if I hadn't been prepared to work for nothing for six months. A few years ago in Melbourne, I went to my local cafe, and I said to the, to the guy there, I said, if I help wash up at the end of the day, would you give me like the free food that you're otherwise going to throw away? He said, that's a great idea. It saved him money. I didn't have to do it if I didn't want to do it, but I literally went away with loads and loads of food and the coffee grounds to put over my plants. And anybody could do that. You could go to your local cafe and offer to do the same thing. So um, I think I first realised that there was a whole kind of alternative economic system when I read Mark Boyle's book, which is called The Moneyless Man. And he's actually uh, spent quite a few years now living without money. And it, it shows that you can actually do this quite simply. He was lucky enough to be given a caravan, and it was sited on a farm. So he worked in exchange for his food, and he grew produce, and he foraged in hedgerows, and he skip-dived, and he had renewable energy, and he had lots of cold showers, admittedly, and he cycled a lot. And the only thing that he really lost was his girlfriend. Um, <laughs> so, but... Um, he did sort of coin this term free economy, which is really, it's just talking about how you can recognise that when you give something to somebody, um, when you volunteer your time or you donate something, you do feel good. And I think that's actually been talked about this morning in the talks previously. And these actions actually create friendship and they create stronger communities. And it's what's called the gift economy. And it's basically the basis behind the idea of karma and the concept of paying it forward. Um, many people will know about internet-based systems that do this sort of thing. For example, FreeCycle, which enables you to give away things that you don't need to somebody who might actually find use for them. Now, a few years ago, 
I had a neighbour's garage to clear, and it was all going to go to the tip until I came to the rescue. And I posted it on FreeCycle, and over a series of weekends, I had a number of people come to the garage, and like some kind of archaeological dig, they would kind of pull through all this stuff in the garage, and they'd reveal more hidden treasures underneath. And it was done really democratically and friendly as well. People shared things. They weren't greedy. And then just last week, I had three scratched saucepans that were no use to me. I put them on free cycle, and a lady came to get them, and she said that she was going to use them for her little girl's mud kitchen. And then she sent me a photograph afterwards when she showed me that the, the mud kitchen had been used and the saucepans had been made for sandpit pies. So I thought that was a really lovely way of rescuing saucepans that would have otherwise gone to waste. Then there's websites like Couchsurfing, where you can host people for free who are travelling, and you get references which then enable you, when you go travelling, to go and stay with other people. And I've hosted lots of people here, and then I've gone travelling in Australia and South Africa, and I've stayed with hosts there. And it's a lovely way to get, the lo get to meet local people as well. Then there's LiftShare, which is a website which enables people who are travelling to hitch up with people who are going in the same direction as them. Now, I don't drive, obviously, too expensive, <laughs> but I'm a, a passionate user of, of trains, and I regularly go between Swansea and Southampton, so I've had an advert on this Lift Show website for years now, actually. I've only ever got one response to go between Swans and Southampton. And it's, it's a long story, but I did end up in Istanbul. So, <laughs> um, basically what happened was it was a student in Swansea from Turkey, and he had friends here in Southampton who were also from Istanbul, and they were all doing psychology over the summer holidays, and they wanted to go and visit each other. So I replied and I said, look, I haven't got a car, I was hoping someone was going to offer me a lift, but I do know how to get cheap train tickets. So I met up with him and I showed him how to get these tickets and we booked them. And it was really bizarre because it turned out that the house that he lived in in Swansea was a house that I lived in when I was a student in the 1980s. And then to make matters worse, his two friends here in Southampton lived in the house that my mum lived in when she was six years old. So we knew that we were connected. It was too much of a coincidence. Needless to say, they had a really lovely summer because they met me and I introduced them to lots of people and they had good fun. And then at the end of the summer, they went home and they said, you have to come to Istanbul. And when I eventually did go, I had a completely free holiday. They wouldn't even allow me to change money at the airport. Um, I was taken to the university. I attended lectures. I had my own flat. I was taken on trips. I was showered with gifts. And, it, and we're still friends today all because I put an advert on a website. Um, then there's also hitchhiking, which I used to do a lot of when I was a student. And I did it recently, actually. And it's not, it's not about saving money necessarily. It's about those human stories that you share with the person that picks you up. And I went to Dungeness a couple of weeks ago, and it took me an hour and a half to walk there. And I was so flipping knackered by the time I got there, I thought, there's no way, I can't walk back to the bus stop. So <laughs> I stuck my thumb out. And a lovely lady picked me up and she took me back to the bus stop. And in that 15, 20 minute drive, we shared so many stories and we laughed so much. And at the end of it, I gave her one of my little brooches that I make as thank you. And I think it's a shame that people don't hitch now as much as we used to when we were younger. Um, what about free economy projects here in Southampton? Well, um, as James mentioned, I set up the Books for Free shop in Southampton about three or four years ago, down the bottom of town near the Bargate with a charity called Healthy Planet. And what they do is they get free um, empty shops that are up for lease that nobody actually is wanting to rent at the time. They take them over and they manage to get a reduction for the business rates for the landlord. So uh, it's a kind of a win-win situation, really. They're not going to sell anything in the shop. They're just going to literally give away free books. So in six, uh, seven months, no, five months we were there, and we, we gave away 15,000 books in that time, and we had loads of different volunteers from all walks of life that would come and help out, a lot of whom um, were maybe a bit marginalised. We had quite a few young men who were unemployed who subsequently went on to get jobs as well. We had some with learning difficulties. We had some who even actually couldn't read, one boy in particular, who learnt to read while he was there, um, which he wouldn't have done. He actually said afterwards that uh, helping out at Books for Free was the best thing that ever happened to him in his life, which was an amazing thing to hear. But we started off, we had no furniture, we made bookshelves out of cardboard boxes and suitcases, and then eventually the public gave us stuff. They gave us um, books, and they gave us furniture and chairs, 
And we became almost like a fully functioning shop. But eventually we had to close down. And I had a feeling that it might have been something to do with the fact that I had a sign written on the window which said, um, welcome to the counter-cultural quarter. The revolution starts here. And I had a feeling that maybe the council weren't too keen on that. So, <laughs> so we had to move. But I found a new home in the third aid centre in Beavers Valley. And it's still going from there. So if you'd like books, we don't really need any more. But if you would like books, do go along and help yourself. And then last year, in Romsey, I got offered another shop with Healthy Planet to run. So that was actually seven months. And we gave away, again, 15,000 books from there. And it was a lovely time. It was a really nice shop near the Abbey. And I used to get off the train in Romsey, and I'd walk down the hill, and I'd used to think, I'm so happy to be here. It was partly <laughs> because I wasn't in Southampton. But, um, <laughs> but it, was, it was really, no, it was because I was going to do a lovely thing in a lovely space with really nice people. And uh, a lot of the customers gave us financial donations. And so in addition to giving money to Healthy Planet, we also gave them to, the money to local uh, organisations, particularly at the Apple Tree Community Centre, and we bought little teddy bears for the special needs children, and we bought art materials for the mental health group, and we bought cooking equipment for the family support group. So we were able to help the local community as well. And then in December last year, I was involved with a project um, called the Tiger Yard Pop-Up Shop in Southampton in East Street. And from there, they were selling locally made hand, um, handmade crafts, like my lovely brooches, and fair trade goods, but we were also giving away free books as well. And one of the first customers that came in was a lady who had a brain tumour, and she came in and she said, I'd really like some videos to watch and some books to read while I take my mind off my upcoming operation. And so we said, well, just help yourself, take whatever you like. And she said, really? We said, yeah, it's all free. And she said, I can't believe it. And she said, look, I'll bring them back, I'll, I'll watch them and I'll, I'll read them and I'll bring them back. And, and she said, this is the kindest shop I have ever been in. And we used to write down, every day we'd get comments like this. We used to write them down because it was so amazing. And she did bring them back a week later. And then on the last day, I thought, we haven't seen her. We've been open for three weeks. And the very last person who came into that shop when we were closing down was this lady with her son to say thank you for what we've done. Now, we don't know what happened with her operation, but, you know, hopefully she's okay. But we were really touching out to people who, who really appreciated what we were doing. She probably couldn't afford to have bought books and videos to take her mind off the problem that she was in. But yeah, Tiger Yard was a lovely space. Um, but I think it's the fact that we're out in the public domain that means that we're able to actually make contact with people in a way that you can't when you're stuck at home. I mean, I might be able to advocate minimalism and voluntary simplicity. But who's going to know that if I'm just at home? So I think the idea of, of reusing spaces that are sitting empty is a wonderful thing because you actually really get to meet the man on the street and the woman on the street as well. Dangerous Ideas in Southampton is a great organisation that's looking at all these different initiatives and gives people a chance to talk about them. So we've had events to do with waste and recycling and creativity and sharing economies. And you'll be able to take part in the workshop this afternoon about that. And one of the things we did was parking day, which was taking over a small piece of road in Southampton by feeding a parking meter. We actually had a little tiny toy car, and we stuck the, the, uh, the ticket on the meter, so on, the, on top of the car, so that people knew that we'd actually fed the meter. And then we would just engage people in conversation. So we had carpet, we had a sofa, we had a table, we had a standard lamp. We were doing knitting, we were eating cake, we were playing Monopoly. And we had one angry customer, well, not a customer, but he was obviously trying to use our space, and he had to park a little bit further down the road. And he said, um, he said, why are you doing this here? He said, why can't you be doing this on the grass? And we said, because then it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be dangerous. It would be a picnic, wouldn't it? And nobody would talk to us. So I said, it's about showing that the street isn't just for cars. You know, it's for people as well. And when he came back an hour later, he actually came and apologised for being angry with us, which was lovely. So... Um, Curb is the food waste cafe, which is out in the foyer here, and that's a sort of a movable feast of supermarket leftovers, which highlight the wastefulness of big businesses by offering free meals, and if you want to make a donation, you can. And uh, it's part of the, the Real uh, Junk Food project, which is popping up all over the country with these type of cafes, where you can actually go and just 
eat off, um, skip dive food, and pay as you feel to the, to the project. Um, so existing buildings, including nightclubs and churches, are being repurposed for these type of events. And the Spire is a church in Ryde on the Isle of Wight that I've been involved with. And there they've been doing fantastic things for the community. So it's a rent-free, rates-free space. It's got a, a huge performing space in the, in the actual church building where they've done theatre and music and cinema. And then underneath is the really interesting bit. They've got a restaurant and a, com and a fully working commercial kitchen. And they've got a community space as well. They've got an area where bands can practice without annoying their neighbours. They've got a recording studio. They've got a corridor, which is going to have um, archery and bowling. Probably not at the same time, in it. Um, and then they're going to put in a climbing wall. And then last week, I set up the Books for Free project there as well. And so already, 250 books have been given away. So why do I do what I do? Well, it's obviously not for the money. Um, Southampton's not the most interesting place I've lived in either. So it helps brighten up an otherwise slightly dull existence. Um, <laughs> and of course, I forgot to get married and have kids as well, so that was a shame. Um, but it's really about small acts of kindness in an economic rationalist world that talks of deficit reduction, cuts, and corporate greed. It's about connecting people face to face, not through the impersonal internet. And I don't do Facebook. Don't ask to be my friend because I'm not interested. Um, my happiest friend. Actually, he doesn't do the internet at all. He just phones people up and talks to them, and he's extremely popular. Um, I'm an analogue person. I, uh, I carry a backpack. I don't have one of those suitcases on wheels. I talk to strangers, because it feels like travelling without moving away too far. And my auntie used to say to me, a smile costs such little effort, but brings such rich reward. These gestures of generosity are well worth the effort, and the real value of the gift economy is actually priceless. We should think about what we can give, not what we can get. And pushing against conventional ideas with new ways of thinking is how we change society to create a better world. It's not about protest and campaigning. It's about human connections. We might not be able to beat the current economic system that swings between wealth and poverty, but there are ways we can bypass this approach with a kinder, more compassionate, and a simpler way of living. Thank you. <laughs>